Bar of Michigan. I'm an attorney and that's the governing body for attorneys. And I was looking at uh, then moving forward to run for an open judge seat. I had gotten all the petitions ready and I was getting ready to uh, get that campaign going uh, when unfortunately I got a call that nobody wants to get. Uh, my wife hadn't been feeling well and uh, we got the news that she had cancer. So I decided I wasn't gonna run. I was gonna focus on family matters and uh, we went forward with that. Fortunately, knock on wood, she hasn't had cancer for the last two years. We made it through there. But I understand the difficulties uh, all of the families that deal with those sort of medical issues have, and that's an advocate they will have on the county board if I'm elected. I'm running now again because after four years of being involved with family and being out of the public eye, I'm just tired of seeing all these elected officials who are acting more like schoolyard bullies than leaders. And I want to get in there and show that we can have community leaders that are good neighbors rather than just people who are being bullies and harassing people out there. So I'm trying to do it again and win another seat that people say a Democrat probably can't win. But the last election cycle, the Republican incumbent only won with 52 percent of the vote. This is going to be a Democrat year. I'm going to be hustling to get that vote, get those votes. And hopefully uh, we'll do it again and I'll be a county commissioner uh, starting the next term. Thank you, Tim. For your first question, at this point, if elected, what is your highest priority and what do you look forward to the most? Uh, what, what project do you look forward to working on the most in January 2021? Sure. Well, my first focus is going to be, um, again, helping us tackle the, the coronavirus. And I think people don't understand how important the health division is when it comes to uh, getting us back on track in regards to both uh, providing treatment, providing PPE, and also in regards to potentially tracking. Uh, if vaccinations come out, they're gonna be involved with the distribution of those. And we need to have leaders in place that will understand that they need to follow medical directions and advice and that science and facts matter. So I wanna make sure we have county commissioners there that are gonna be doing, understanding the important role of the health division and, and helping us move forward from this uh, pandemic. Uh, one of the pet projects I always enjoy uh, working on was I was a real big advocate of the park system. And I really enjoy, again, being involved uh, with some of those aspects, especially making sure that uh, we are getting uh, fair representation for the whole county and using the system uh, based upon how the tax dollars are allocated. The southern and middle portion of the county put a lot of money into the parks, but a lot of the projects and, and the uh, property is in the more northern part. And, and that makes sense, but I want to make sure that everyone's getting a good uh, value out of the system and we keep it at a, a good level of uh, quality, especially with the financial issues we're probably going to be facing with the crisis from the economy kind of taking a tumble here from the pandemic. Thank you, Tim. Your next question, what are your plans to improve racial justice in your communities? Well, that's a good question. And you know, one of the issues I have is that uh, I work as primarily a criminal defense attorney. So I've seen lots of issues where people are uh, discriminated against uh, based upon racial, religious, as well as economic issues. And I want to work through the committees that supervise the uh, the the sheriff's department and the prosecutor's office to make sure that everyone's being treated equally, not just based upon their economic status or their racial or religious views. Uh, when I was a county commissioner before, unfortunately, we had a, a commissioner who was the chairman of the committee who was sick for an extended period of time. So I took over uh, chairing that committee as a Democrat. And I was one of the few Democrats that actually probably have chaired a committee until the Democrats took the majority more recently. And, uh, you know, I was looking out to see how we can impact the budget. One of the things I was trying to prevent was the militarization of the uh, sheriff's department uh, when I was in charge of that committee. And, and those are types of things I want to make sure that we're not making it seem as if we're being uh, aggressive or at war with different ethnic groups. We need to make sure that we're all on the same side here. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question, what are your views in expands and expanding regional transit? Well, I think that's important. I'm a mass advocate, uh, I'm an advocate for mass transit. I believe that we need to address urban sprawl. Um, 
I believe that uh, we probably could have got a bigger bang for our buck if we invested in mass transit versus expanding the I-75 freeway that's going on right now. Um, and uh, I think it involves a uh, approach where uh, we have everyone together because you do need to get an um, economy of scale to actually get the program in place. And we also need cooperation because we're losing out on a lot of federal funding because we aren't communicating and getting along. So I, I'm an advocate for uh, looking into seeing what we can do to improve the system so that it works for everyone. Okay, thank you. Now uh, we have time for um, a question from the chat room. Uh, let's see. Um, Okay, this is not for you. This is for the next group. So I will, I'm going to okay. ask you one, another one that I had um, in, in my sure. part here. <laughs> and that is, um, what are your plans to address climate change at the, at the county level? What can be done at the county level to address this? Well, one of the things that I would like to see is the county look into expanding its home improvement program to make it more accessible for doing uh, solar power for uh, lower income communities within the county. Uh, that would help alleviate the need for using some of the coal powered uh, type uh, programs uh, that the current uh, utilities are using and get uh, more uh, green energy going into the system. Also would improve property values and uh, a dependence on, on, on some communities that could use a little bit of a boost. So um, there's some issues with that I like to see. I also want to make sure that we are working to um, see what we are doing to reduce the carbon imprint the county's doing through its different uh, buildings and maintenance that we're doing, as well as our vehicle fleet, seeing what we can do to try to get that uh, potentially to be a green green, uh, green fleet. I like to see to try to get the fleet moving to an electric vehicle fleet. Um, one of the things I advocated for when I was on the county board before was is that we needed to build a new airport terminal. And uh, we initially bid it out as a LEED certified program. And uh, when the economy sank, they were trying to, to get rid of away some of those energy efficiency type projects and, and lose that LEED certification. And I said, this is gonna be a building that's gonna be for generations of use. We need to have it be LEED certified and actually reverse that again. And that building's been built and it's LEED certified. Uh, so that shows that, you know, I've been an advocate for a long time and making sure that we're being environmentally conscious and responsible when it comes to uh, our infrastructure with both the county resources and in the communities that I represent. Thank you. So, oh, and I was uh, yeah. endorsed by the Sierra Club. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so it's time for your closing statement. You have one minute. Well, I just like to say again, my name is Tim Burns. I do have a primary challenger. Uh, so we're trying to do grassroots, grassroots out there, let people know to vote Tim Burns on the primary ballot so I can be against the Republican incumbent in the fall. So if you know anyone that's in Rochester Hills or Troy, appreciate you uh, getting the word out that Tim Burns is a good guy. Uh, he's been in office before. He's a good Democrat and uh, he will hopefully get us a victory and flip a seat for us in the fall. Tim, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation. Yes. And um, just a reminder, Tim Burns is running for county commissioner in the 11th district. Good luck. Thanks. Okay. So our next uh, pair of candidates. Um, we have... Um, we're, we have the opportunity now to hear from two candidates running for Oakland County Commissioner in uh, District 12. That includes Birmingham, Bloomfield Hills, and a portion of Bloomfield Township. We welcome uh, Kelly DeLaha and William Gage. Uh, we're gonna go in alphabetical order by last name for the opening statement and reverse the alphabetical order for a closing statement. Uh, Kelly DeLaha, that means we'll start with you. And for your opening statement, where is Kelly? Wave your hand. We can I, I mute it or I, I can't see my video. Oh, someone. Can you do that? Can you change that Kent or? Oh, there I did it. Okay. There we did. Okay, good. We wanna see your face. <laughs> Welcome Hi. Kelly. You have two minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Sherry. And thank you to the 11th district Democrats. Um, five years ago, I left my full-time employment to take care of my mother, Pat, who had Alzheimer's disease. 
And she got to a point where she could no longer afford her disease and we had run out of care options. I experienced firsthand the challenges that seniors have in getting housing, medical care, prescriptions, transportation. It was gut-wrenching to watch my mom decline without dignity, and it's something I never want another family to experience. And that is what has spurred me to run for office. I see that there's similar issues going in the county on, on other topics, and I think that I can be effective in changing those. I've talked a lot in the past about my experience uh, with Birmingham Public Schools and PTA and fundraising and with many countless organizations across Oakland County, including being a founding member of Femmes for Dems board. But tonight I wanna emphasize my professional experience as a university administrator for over 20 years working for Wayne State, Oakland University and Henry Ford College where I did student services and community, community relations. What I did every day is I asked, how can I help the university reach its mission to serve the community? And how can I help my students reach their academic goals? And I did that through establishing relationships with businesses, government, nonprofits. I brought them to the table and I worked collaboratively. And I wanna emphasize that as a county commissioner, I think that's important because I'll be doing the same thing every day. I will be waking up and asking, how can I help the county reach its goal to serve the community? And how can I make residents' lives better? That's how I plan to approach my work collaboratively and with these strong relationships that I have throughout Oakland County. Thank you, Kelly. William Gage, welcome. Where are you? Thank you. I'm up here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Um, it's time for your opening statement. Two minutes. Yes, I'm Bill Gage. Uh, I'm not a politician, never have been. Uh, I was a uh, trial attorney. I did medical malpractice trial work for over four decades. I worked in uh, Detroit, Oakland County, and all around the area. I was born and bred in, uh, in Detroit from Brightmoor, the, uh, the youngest of four children. My father passed away when I was 10. Uh, we, uh, we, with a strong woman, uh, survived that. And uh, I have been interested in uh, justice and equity and equality for many years. I've handled many uh, police brutality cases in my practice, in addition to the medical malpractice work I did. Uh, the, the, the fact that we have inequality and injustice is not accidental. It is a result of governmental policies which have been passed over and over and over again. And I think these things need to be addressed. So I am looking forward to, if I'm successful, working on some of these issues. I think we need to deal with, uh, you know, I listened to the other night to a commission hearing. Everybody said Black Lives Matter. I thought that was, that's a wonderful sentiment. But I didn't hear anybody say we're going to do anything about it. I just heard this say Black Lives Matter. What we need is a commission or something created by the county, a committee, to actually start taking testimony and do something in the nature of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to actually deal with the problem. We're one of the wealthiest counties in, in the state. We have unequal housing, we have unequal schooling, we have unequal medical care. I am interested and fascinated to deal with all those issues and I've retired, so I now have time to do it. Thank you, Bill. Sure. Okay, our first question. We're going to flip back and forth, alternate. We're gonna be starting. Uh, the first question will be uh, Kelly. Uh, let's see if I got that right. I think I have that mixed up now. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Bill. Um, you'll be starting with the first question. At this point, if elected, what is the highest priority and what do you look forward to working on the most in 2021? Criminal justice reform. And I think with my background in law, it will be very helpful to work on that issue. Uh, we have two systems of criminal justice. We have people in jail right now because they can't afford a $50 bail or a $100 fine, or they can't afford to pay for their probation. Uh, it, it just isn't right. There is no need. You know, we, we should have gotten rid of debtors prisons with uh, Charles Dickens but we still have them because uh, people who can't afford proper legal defense, can't afford the cost of going to court, can't, uh, 
can't afford the bail bonds. They haven't been convicted of anything. They got a bail bond, but they simply can't afford to pay it. So they go to jail. It's not only bad for them, it's very expensive for the county to jail these people. So criminal justice reform will be one of the, one of the things that I would absolutely love to start working on. I think we could have a great impact on it in terms of what happens in our county. In fact, I think Oakland County can be a model county for the whole state on a number of issues. And I would like to see us lead on this issue. Thank you, Bill. Kelly, the same question. At this point, if elected, what is the highest priority and what do you look forward to working on the most in January, 2021? You have um, well, two minutes. Okay, well, my highest priority is to make sure that um, our families are protected, our seniors are protected from COVID. We need to make sure that we have equipment, resources, and testing in place. Um, we also need to help businesses reopen safely. My sons are grocery store workers, so I've seen firsthand what can happen when a small business is struggling to understand the, the rules from the government and try to implement those, uh, get the equipment that they need to keep their customers and their employees safe. So those are things that I want to address. But also, I want to make sure that we have clean, safe drinking water in Birmingham and Bloomfield and throughout the county. Um, we've had we have lead service lines that are coming from the streets into the houses here in Birmingham, the area I'll be representing. While that is the municipal, municipality's responsibility to repair, the county can be doing things to help speed that process up so that we're not waiting two, two, five, ten 10 years for those replacements to be made. And also I want, as a member of the Oakland County Sanitary Code Appeal Board, I've now become very aware of the problems with sanitation systems in the county and throughout the state. We are the only state that does not have a statewide sanitary code. If the state won't do it, the county needs to do it. So we need to make sure that we are protecting our land and our groundwater that is near these sanitation systems of homes and also the wells that are nearby. We inspect right now when there's a new build or a remodel, but we need to be doing that more frequently. Um, and then finally, I want to make sure that we're, like I said before, that we're addressing the needs of our growing senior population. In the next 15 years, approximately 40% of the county will be over age 65, and they have unique needs that need to be addressed. So whenever we're creating policies, we need to keep those needs in mind and that population in mind. Thank you, Kelly. Kelly, we'll start with you on this next question. Um, for transparency's sake, uh, who makes up most of your donor base? Um, you have two minutes. Oh, okay. Well, um, it's small donors. I have mainly small donors. Um, I have been very active in the community. So I am blessed that people believe and trust in me after working with me through as a university professional, as a small business owner here in town. Um, as an advocate and a grassroots organizer, I have a lot of connections in town and people are willing to support me. And if that's a $5 donation, that's wonderful if that's what they can afford. I know right now my husband's unemployed due to COVID. And so we are struggling to support the candidates that we, that we like, but um, you know, any small amount is appreciated. I do have um, endorsements from several of skilled trade groups and some other women's organizations in the area. And I appreciate their help, uh, but that's mainly, most of my donations have been from small dollar donations. Okay. Thank you. Bill, you have the same question. For transparency's sake, who makes up most of your donor base? Two my minutes. answer is very simple. I'm not a politician. I believe in getting money out of politics. It is the biggest problem we have at every level of government. I have raised no money. I will raise no money. I'm not spending any money. I filed an affidavit saying I would spend less than $1,000 on the campaign. I'm just trying to get my name out and my information, my ideas out to the community however I can. And that's what I think you should be able to do, especially at a local election. So that answer is very simple. Thank you, Bill. Next question, start with Bill. What are your plans to address climate change at the county level? Well, I heard the uh, first gentleman give his response to that and I thought his ideas were very good. The very first thing we need to do is have the county decide that they're going green. 
all their buildings uh, to whatever extent possible should be transformed into green energy. And we have lots of buildings in the county and we have a billion dollars that goes through our budget every year. So they could very, they could just start with themselves. The second thing is any, any kind of assistance we can get to help homeowners transform from coal burning or gas burning or whatever uh, uh, energy they're using now into clean energy would be very helpful. Uh, I'd love to see uh, solar panels on every house in, in Oakland County. And uh, actually they're very competitive from any standpoint of uh, finances these days. I've also heard recently, and I don't really, I haven't been able to investigate this fully, but uh, I understand that some places are using plastic actually to make asphalt for roads. Now that's something we should look into. What, what a wonderful idea if we could transform one of our biggest problems, the excess of plastic into asphalt roads, which is another one of our biggest problems. I think somebody once said fix the damn roads and I uh, kind of agree with that. So uh, I, there, are, there, are, uh, there needs to be direct attention to an effort to change it green. That's the whole idea. It's not being done now as far as I can tell. Thank you, Bill. Kelly, same question. What are your plans to address climate change at the county level? Thank you. Um, so just yesterday, I met with a coalition of environmental groups that are based here in the area to hear their ideas. So I think, first of all, whoever is our representative needs to be listening to what our constituents are saying are their priorities. Um, there are groups that are high school students who are advocating for environmental change. There are retirees. There are families who are, all have different needs and different wants. Um, the thing that we have the most immediate control over is the buildings and operations through the county because we we obviously are the ones approving that budget. So um, I've worked in facilities management uh, through Wayne State University and I have some experience in working with uh, trades and with the facilities people to replace and update buildings and that's a, a great start to make sure that our buildings are up to code and um, environmentally friendly. Um, I would also like to see us expand into economically looking at the clean energy sector. How can we capitalize on that and build on that so we can create jobs in Oakland County? We have a lot of skilled trades here. We have businesses here that are looking for ways to expand. I think that this is an area that, we, that would help meet the needs of, we have a lot of people who are not employed right now we have universities and community colleges here who can help train people and trades that can help train people to be able to enter jobs in that field and, and help our economy at the same time while we're improving our environment. Thank you, Kelly. Our next question, we'll start with Kelly. Um, what are your plans to improve racial justice in our, your communities? Well, when I was talking earlier about my experiences with my mom trying to gain access to uh, understand what our options were for housing and for medical care, I think part of it is just that I didn't even know it, I didn't have access. And I think that is the problem is that, uh, that we don't do a great job of communicating the wonderful services that we do have to our communities. Um, the current county commission has established um, healthcare centers in, in Southfield and in uh, Pontiac, they're working on those right now. And those will help meet the needs of people who very much need things, um, these services. I think that we could be looking at all aspects of the policies and, and our operations to see where there's improvement and where people are being denied access or not being communicated with properly. And that's where I would start. Okay, thank you. Bill, same question. What are your plans to improve racial justice in our community? Your well, as I spoke about a little earlier, I'm very interested in judicial reform and criminal justice reform. And that unfortunately impacts black and brown people much stronger, much more strongly than white people. So I would be very interested in working on that. It's no accident that we have people in jail who are more black and more brown than white because they, they are policed differently. 
And on that level, we ask the police to do way too much. Police are not trained to be psychologists or psychiatrists. They're not trained to treat people who are having a psychiatric break. We send the police out for every reason. In the poor communities, we send them out for every reason. In the rich communities, we send them out and they, you know, they'll drive you home if you're drunk. In the poor communities, they'll take you to jail. So there's, there's an inequality that exists in police enforcement, criminal law, justice, and it needs to be directly affected by policies which are intended to change it. And we can change it to the better for the whole county. We cannot just change it. This isn't, this isn't a favor to black people. Everybody wants to live in a society, or at least most people want to live in a just and fair society. So it's ridiculous to think that this is just doing some, you know, some special favor for black people. This is doing what we should have been doing 200 years ago. And we need to correct it. And we need to correct it on a national level. So I, we can't impact it nationally, but we could do it locally. And as I said earlier, maybe we can be the model county for the entire state that look at Oakland County, they're attacking the racial and disparity problem. I would love to see that. I would be so proud to live in this county if we in fact did it and we got it running in the state of Michigan or wider. Thank you, Bill. We um, have one more, have time actually for one more question. Um, and I'm going to attempt to take it from the chat room. <laughs> Hopefully I'll construct it through uh, several different exchanges here to get something that uh, uh, makes sense. So bear with me. Um, and this will uh, we'll begin with um, Bill on this one. Um, how would you as a county commissioner and, and, and the county commission in general ensure that they are not a rubber stamp for the county executive and administration? Well, actually that's something I'm quite interested in because I've watched some county commission hearings and there seem to be some people who are very knowledgeable about our billion dollar uh, budget. But there are others who vote, it looks like they're just voting because the uh, finance committee said that was a good idea or it was a bad idea. I think anybody who has the obligation to vote has also the obligation to know what they're voting on. So I would like to see a, a much more intense process of looking at the uh, expenses of the county. They just changed a policy where they have to have uh, commission uh, authority for, for services, professional services, over $100,000. That means prior to this, that uh, somebody in the executive department without any other uh, approval could go ahead and, and issue contracts with, uh, with, with no, no restrictions on it for over $100,000. I think the commission needs to be more involved in the expenditure of a billion dollars of tax money that goes through the county. Thank you, Bill. Kelly, now the same uh, question to you. How does a county commission and commissioners ensure that they are not a rubber stamp for the county executive and administration? Two minutes. I think there's a, an, an amount of preparedness that, um, as, as Bill just mentioned, uh, get making sure that you understand the issue very much uh, by doing the research. So I know as my experience on the, on the sanitation appeal board, I spend a lot of time looking with papers I'm prepared ahead of time before I go into a meeting to understand what I'm voting on. And I would approach the, this the same way. Um, I think that it's important that uh, not just, not just um, I think it's important for the commissioner to not only be working in the meetings, but also before by getting to know their constituents, that they're out in the community, that they're active and they're hearing exactly what, what their constituents want so that when they go into those meetings, they're advocating for them. And I think that piece has been missing from our budget process for a long time. I think uh, some of the people who have represented us before feel like they're the experts and they don't need to reach out to their constituents and get their opinions and 
So I would like to change that aspect of it by making sure that I'm very involved in the community, that I'm talking to people, that I'm listening to their needs, and that the budget reflects the values that we share. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you both for participating in this forum tonight. Um, we have now have your closing statements, and that will be one minute apiece. And we will begin with, uh, we reverse the order from the opening statements. So we'll start with Bill. Yes, I, uh, as I say, I'm not a politician, never have been. I've been passionate about the issues that I'm talking about. I've been a member of the ACLU. I've been on some of their legal teams and attacking the sobriety check lane case. Uh, I've represented police killings in Detroit uh, many times in addition to my malpractice work. But what really got me fascinated was I worked with the voters, not politicians, and we actually got the Michigan Constitution amended. And I was so happy every time I spoke to voters who were saying, what's this about? And once I explained it, they were thrilled to death to sign it. And Republicans, Democrats, didn't matter because they want the people to be in charge of their government. It is no accident we have inequality. It's no accident we have poverty. And we need to change those things. And those will be my primary source or my primary emphasis if I'm elected. Thank you, Bill. Kelly, one minute for your closing statement. Yes, thank you to the 11th. Um, the 11th district, everyone. Um, I am also not a career politician, but I also understand that this seat is critical. We need to keep the majority in order to get things done that have never been able to be done in my lifetime on this commission. So it's imperative that we win. And the way that we do that is getting our name out there. And I worked in marketing. Uh, simple word of mouth doesn't work anymore, especially during a pandemic. We need to have an online presence. We need to be mailing to people. We need to be, we can't just hope that they've heard about us. So I have a very strong marketing plan in place. I'm doing my best to reach out to voters. I'm on these calls all the time. I'm reaching out to organizations. I'm mailing, I'm, I'm not door knocking, but I will be hanging door hangers, uh, dropping lit. I mean, we've, we've got to get the word out and I'm working really hard and we've got a hard competitor if we make it through to the next round. So uh, I appreciate your support and I hope that you will consider voting for me on August 4th. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you to both of you, um, our candidates for Oakland County Commissioner for the 12th District, Kelly DeLaha and William Gage. Thanks for being here. And um, for all the, the Oakland County Commissioner candidates. I think it's so exciting to meet such good candidates and think about this new era we're going into or we're entering into in Oakland County government. It's very exciting. So our next segment, we move into um, the race for Oakland County Treasurer. Got all my papers here, hang on, I'll get it right. <laughs> Yes, uh, we'll be hearing from Robert Corbett and Robert Wittenberg. The same format will apply during this segment and each candidate will be given two minute opening statements followed by questions and ending with a one minute closing statement. So I've been calling candidates by their first names this evening in order for it not to be too uh, formal, but we have two Roberts in this round. <laughs> and I went online and noticed that Mr. Corbett also goes by Bill, where are you? Would you be willing to be called Bill? No, because it's not my name. <laughs> Bob. Oh, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> Although Bill, if that's Bill, what you want to go with. <laughs> I've been saying Bill for the last 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Okay, good catch. Okay, so um, that, there will be less confusion. So we have the Oakland County Treasure candidates, Bob Corbett, <laughs> and Robert Wittenberg, and we welcome you both here tonight. Um, so we will be hearing opening statements from each of you. We'll go in alphabetical order, and we'll be beginning with uh, Bob. Thank you, Emily. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, thank you very much to the 11th uh, District uh, Democratic uh, Caucus or uh, District for uh, hosting this evening. Uh, you have a very important job in front of you this fall, and that's retaining the seat. I think it's, uh, I don't think I'm exactly uh, 
going out on a limb here to say retention of this seat is critical towards uh, maintaining the um, majority in the House. So uh, good luck. I, I certainly will be uh, supporting your efforts uh, uh, as we go along. Uh, again, my name is uh, Bob Corbett. I am on the ballot as Robert. Uh, I am a, a lifelong Democrat. I uh, began working in Oakland County uh, Democratic politics in 1972. I was a McGovern delegate to the uh, Michigan State Convention, and I have been working since then. Uh, I did run for county commissioner a couple times in the mid-70s. Um, I was a Democrat in a strongly Republican district, so that didn't really work very well. But um, I've stayed active over the years. I've been a precinct delegate. I've kind of lost track. I think it's 15 or 16 terms now, along with my wife, the last uh, eight or nine. I am a member of the Madison Heights City Council, a lifelong resident. I've served, uh, I've been reelected now to my sixth term. And uh, I am um, uh, educated at uh, the University of Detroit. I uh, came out of Bishop Foley High School. And um, I think I'll, uh, I will quit there for the moment. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll pick up uh, as we go along on some of the other questions. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you, Bob. And uh, Robert, Robert Wittenberg, you have your opening statement, two minutes. Thank you, sorry, I was waiting to get unmuted there. Um, <laughs> well, thank you to the 11th, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good to see some familiar faces. I'm Robert Wittenberg running for Oakland County Treasurer. Uh, I am a third term state representative in Southern Oakland County. Uh, I've worked for the last or 15 years prior to that uh, as a licensed life and health insurance agent. Um, I think I last spoke to this group at the picnic uh, back in the fall, and a lot has changed in the world, obviously, since then uh, with coronavirus. Uh, also, personally, we welcomed our son Abel in March, and our daughter just turned two last week. Uh, so it's been exhausting, but it's been amazing. Uh, and things have also shifted in this country, as we, we've seen as it relates to, you know, racism and injustice, uh, and it's long overdue um, because we know this isn't, hasn't been an issue just in law enforcement, but it has been prevalent throughout society. Um, and obviously I wanna uh, listen and continue to help and serve in the capacity as a state representative and uh, hopefully as the Oakland County Treasurer. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a little more later, but I'm, I'm running because I love helping people and, and that's why I'm in public service. I'm the same, I don't consider myself a politician. I consider myself a public servant. Uh, and I want to continue serving, but on a broader scale. Uh, and just briefly, as a legislator, I've worked on many uh, issues. A lot of people know me. I'm the founder and chair of our Legislative Gun Violence Prevention Caucus. And I was doing that when I was being called out even by Democrats for being crazy for what I was doing. Uh, and so I always believe that I, I'm going to always do what's right, not what's politically expedient. Uh, working on the graduated income tax, uh, setting up a state retirement savings program. Uh, and I believe that our treasurer should be uh, trustworthy and compassionate. Uh, and I believe those are the, the traits that I have uh, shown as a state representative. Uh, we've hosted uh, every month, we host two coffee hours, we host town halls, uh, very responsive to our constituents. Uh, I think we should be both fiscally responsible and socially conscious as the treasurer, making sure that everyone in the county has uh, equal representation. Uh, and so those are the things that I want to do as uh, Oakland County Treasurer and uh, my time is up. So I look forward to the question portion. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Our first question, uh, what are your plans to deal with the tax shortfall in Oakland County due to COVID-19? And we'll begin with Robert, you have two minutes. So uh, as of right now, right? So a lot of this, there's gonna be a lag when it comes to uh, the shortfall. Obviously right now as a, as a legislator, we are seeing that uh, in Lansing and we have a hole in our budget and we're gonna have to deal with this. Uh, but I think what we have to do at the county treasurer, as a treasurer, we have to be very proactive uh, to make sure that people are able to stay in their homes, right? I mean, the one thing that people are very familiar with the treasurer's office, uh, unfortunately, is uh, the foreclosure process. And so it is incumbent upon us to be very proactive uh, to try to keep people in their homes. The foreclosure uh, is the worst case scenario. We don't want anyone to be foreclosed on. It's bad for them. It's bad for their neighborhood. Uh, and so some of the things that I want to do uh, are getting together, uh, you know, making pub, uh, public private partnerships to put together homeowner uh, relief funds and small business relief funds to try to help out 
uh, because we know this is going to have a lasting impact, right? This is going to this is going to go on for quite some time, unfortunately. Uh, and so, being proactive in that uh, portion, and then also education, making sure people are aware of the resources that are available to them. There are some uh, grants and funding mechanisms that people can utilize from the federal government, from the state government, with MISHTA. Uh, and so making sure that they are aware of the resources. Also, there's poverty exemptions that most people don't know how to apply for, and I'd like to standardize that. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, making sure that, like I said, proactive so that people know uh, that they can get on payment plans, uh, that we can help them out as treasurer. And, and you know, I've been a hard worker my whole life. I've been out campaigning for this, obviously, since September. Um, and I think it's important that we uh, host town halls, knock on doors, call people, uh, to make sure that they understand the importance and what we do as the treasurer's office to try to help and support them. Thank you, Robert. Bob, the same question. What are your plans to deal with the tax shortfall in Oakland County due to COVID-19? Well, I think Representative Wittenberg hit, hit it right on the head. Um, uh, in my, uh, my private life, I'm a, a real estate broker and I have been for over 40 years. I think unique among all the candidates running for treasurer. I have hands-on experience with the treasurer's office that goes back uh, 40 years. So I remember back before computerization and so on. The point of that story is I understand fundamentally the difference between the treasurer's office of uh, Treasurer Meisner and everything that went on before that. I think he, he stepped forward uh, some years ago and took the initiative on many of the uh, programs related to foreclosure, getting out there, making sure people knew what their rights were, uh, what their options were and so on. I think the key is going to be going down the road, expanding that, whether it's through the town halls, whether it's through, uh, uh, we've actually in our community in Madison Heights have have a group of volunteers who will go door to door. Now you got privacy issues you got to be careful about, but we'll directly reach out to families and ask if there's some help that can be given, some guidance that can be given. These are the sorts of things because, as a matter of fact, you know the treasurer's office used to be under under the old days, uh, just would sit there and. Um, uh, it was sort of like uh, in the in the middle of the track waiting for the train to hit it. We've begun to move forward with more progressive uh, programming over the past 10, 12 years. We've got to expand that going forward, especially given what's going on uh, in our country right now. Um, you know, it, 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 there's no telling where the, the, the county is going to be six months from now or 12 months from now. Is Congress going to act responsibly and support uh, working men and women, or are we going off a cliff until hopefully we get a Democratic president? So there's a lot of uncertainty there. And the point of that is whoever is the next treasurer has got to do their best to be out front on these things and reaching out to people in the neighborhoods and in our communities. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, is, is related to that in some way. What do you plan to do to help soften the economic challenges faced by Oakland County residents due to COVID-19? And we'll start with Bob. Well, it really has to do with a lot of the same things that, that we were talking about. Now, there is an additional mechanism that, that, that has yet to be fully explored, but I think that's only because it's been only about, what is it, a year, year and a half, we've had a, uh, a Democratic government in, in uh, Oakland County, a Democratic uh, big D. Um, and, and, and that's the idea of the treasurer's office and the county as a whole, working with individual communities. That's the mechanism. The county lending its credit uh, rating, its support, uh, its financial acumen uh, to go into communities that are having issues that they have to face. For example, for example, infrastructure improvement. We've been hearing about that for 10, uh, for 10 years out of Washington in the last three and a half years out of this White House and we haven't seen anything coming from it. Uh, we've got to begin to deal with that here. And that's a way in the communities that we can continue to support the viability of neighborhoods uh, uh, so that they remain places people want to live, people want to try and stay in. And if you can combine that uh, with aggressive programming uh, to, um, to help people stay in their homes who are under stress financially. Uh, really, that's a that would be a big step forward. Uh, and really, I think an expansion of the sort of work that the county commission and the county treasurer are doing now. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Robert, 
Same question. What do you plan to do to help soften the economic challenges facing Oakland County residents due to the COVID-19? Two minutes. Yep, yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, I kind of alluded to some of this earlier. Um, one of the things that I've talked about is, you know, public-private partnerships, putting together funds, homeowner relief funds, and uh, small business relief funds, because actually anyone can pay someone else's tax bill. Uh, and so if we have these funds in place and then we are helping out those uh, that need the most help, uh, I think that'll be tremendous. Uh, that'll be, you know, tremendous for the county and, 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 and try to prevent these catastrophic situations from happening, right? We don't want to see what happened in 2008 and 2009. Uh, so it's really important to be uh, proactive when it comes to that. Uh, I'm also currently working on bills uh, with our current treasurer, Andy Meisner. Uh, he is, uh, I'm his state representative. Uh, and I'm proud actually to have his endorsement in this race, but working on uh, legislation currently to try to help people who are impacted specifically uh, with COVID-19 and how it's impacting them financially, uh, but also uh, moving forward, giving more discretion to the treasurer's office, because currently uh, when it comes to fees and interest rates, it's standard, it's set at the state level. So trying to do more uh, to give discretion uh, so that the treasurer can actually be a little more lenient and help out those people that need it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, standardizing the poverty exemption, making sure people uh, understand that it is available to them. Uh, and then the last thing obviously is education, 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 making sure people know the resources that are available to them. Uh, they have resources that are available through the federal government, through the state government, and uh, we need to be doing all that we can to educate people so that they know uh, that we are here to serve and to help them and to try to keep them in, the, in their homes. And so I, I completely agree that I grew up here in Oakland County and went to Berkeley High School. My wife's from here in Oakland County. We're raising our family here. We want people to thrive here in Oakland County. And so we'll do all that we can to make sure everyone uh, can, can survive and stay and thrive in Oakland County. Thank you, Robert. Uh, the next question. If elected, what is your highest priority? And um, I, I like the uh, twist to this. What do you look forward to the most working on in uh, uh, January, 2021? So I think I'm first on this one, right? Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I have, you know, my, my, my main priorities that I, I talk about are, uh, and again, we've, we've kind of touched on these, uh, but the fi financial security and well-being of every resident in Oakland County, uh, making sure that everyone is taken care of here. Uh, and along with that is, you know, goes preventing foreclosure. So uh, that's really important. Also uh, helping to recruit new businesses while supporting existing businesses. Uh, when we're talking about the, the lasting impact of COVID, uh, obviously it's gonna impact, you know, the homeowners here, but it's also gonna impact businesses and doing all that we can to, to support them uh, and make sure that they're able to thrive here in the community. And then one of the other things, obviously, is, you know, we, we, we herald our, we talk about our uh, AAA bond rating, uh, and that is important, right? That, that, that trickles down to our local communities as well. Uh, and so it's really important that we, we keep our AAA bond rating. So uh, as hopefully as the next Oakland County Treasurer, I'll be a, a, you know, a good steward, a responsible steward uh, of our tax dollars uh, and making sure that we are investing, um, you know, I know there's been some, some questions about, uh, environmental issues and things like that, making sure we're investing in, in companies that we're proud to invest in uh, and making sure that we are good stewards of the taxpayer dollars here in Oakland County. So those are the things I wanna work on right away. And then again, engaging the community, engaging people to educate them so that they know what resources are available and to know that we, we are here because a lot of people don't know or aren't familiar with the treasurer's office does or that they even exist uh, unless they get to the point where Unfortunately, they've had some kind of uh, financial issues and have had trouble paying their taxes. So again, being more proactive, preventive, and helping people before they will ever have to come to us for that terrible situation, even you know, before it occurs. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Bob, same question. If elected, what do you look forward to the most working on? What's your priority in January of 2021? Well, I think a, a couple of things, um, similar to what uh, the representative was saying, but um, I think I especially am interested in working in the area of investment policy for the county. Uh, I think it's important that we continue to move forward in the direction that we are with an open and transparent uh, investment uh, policy. And, and I think I would like to work with the, the uh, Board of Commissioners and the executive in terms of trying to fashion a policy that at least seeks out qualified local lenders 
who are also investing in Oakland County and trying to do business with them. Um, there obviously are limitations and they have to be meet certain qualifications of size and, and soundness. But I think it's important that we reward uh, financial institutions that are already investing in our communities. They're also helping our families uh, and uh, the workers who, uh, who are uh, helping to make Oakland County uh, the tremendous place that it is. Uh, beyond that, um, I really think that um, we need to take a hard look um, at, uh, as, as has been mentioned a couple of times, uh, what we can do in terms of gathering money and resources to support the communities, whether we're talking uh, investment, as I said earlier, in infrastructure, in building and so on. These are critical factors because if we aren't supporting the communities, if we aren't helping our schools, um, then we risk uh, losing uh, our um, our communities, our individual cities, and the the value for the homeowners on their property. Thank you, Bob. Um, we have time for a quick question from the chat. Um, this question is from Sandy. She wants to know if elected Oakland County Treasurer, would uh, you have to step down? Either of you have to step down from other uh, elected positions to avoid conflict of interest? Uh, we'll am I first? I'm sorry. Actually, okay, we'll start with Robert. Um, this is from Sandy. If elected Oakland County Treasurer, would you have to step down from other elected positions to avoid conflict of interest? Uh, I would not, no, not in my position. I'm actually term limited in the, in the State House of Representatives serving in my third term. That's a whole other story talking about uh, term limits mm -hmm. and, and what they've done to our state. Uh, we have the most restrictive term limits in the country mm -hmm. and um, I, I could go off on a tangent on that, but no, uh, I am all done in, uh, at the end of December, no matter what. And so obviously I'm hoping to serve as the next Oakland County treasurer. And uh, funny thing as well, actually with the treasurer's office, it's slightly different than uh, other offices. You actually don't take office until halfway through the year uh, in the following year. So I know uh, talking to Andy Meisner about this in, before when he won and he actually beat an incumbent, uh, he was hired on in the incumbent's office and worked there for some time until he actually took over as the treasurer. So uh, no, it is not a conflict for, for me. Thank you, Robert. Bob? And oh, yeah, and as, yeah, as for me, our, uh, the charter, I don't know about state law, about not, not incompatible offices, but anyway, the charter of Madison Heights would dictate that after my election of, uh, as treasurer is certified, I would have to resign from office a few days later in November. Now, that does bring up an interesting question. The representative was correct about um, the uh, treasurer taking office in the middle of next July. We have an interesting possibility, though, if uh, Mr. Meisner is elected executive, um, he will be taking office shortly after the election. It's no guarantee what the Board of Commissioners will do, but there could very well be a vacancy in the treasurer's office in November. So I would think that the winner of the election would uh, be appointed, but that's not a given, but whoever is elected better be ready to, uh, to step up if Mr. Meisner is moving on, so. Hey, Don't you just love that. politics, you know? <laughs> An interesting uh, <laughs> thought there. So it's time for our closing statements. Um, we uh, will, we started with um, uh, Robert, right? I think, I'm, I think we started with Bob. Started with Bob, I, yes. Okay, so we'll start with Robert for your closing statement. Or, uh, or Bill, Bill will go second Bill. and Bob will go first. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, all right, so my timer stops now. Thank you. Um, well, thank you all for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, I, you know, I think obviously uh, my track record as a legislator um, that I believe I'm trustworthy, I'm accessible, I'm transparent. And I think those are all things uh, that we will want from our county treasurer. Um, I, and my time is limited. So just if you want to hear more, obviously this was this is very brief and I appreciate you guys hosting this event. Uh, but if you want, want to find out more about my campaign or hopefully to get involved, uh, you can go to my website, which is www.robertwittenberg.com. Very original. Uh, happy to have a lot of endorsements, including our, uh, your congressperson, Haley Stevens, uh, Brenda Lawrence, Andy Levin, the current treasurer, Andy Meisner, a lot of labor groups, uh, all of my, uh, all the Democratic state legislators in Oakland County. I think they've seen that I'm a hard worker, that I am uh, someone that they can trust in this office and they believe in me. So I'm honored to have all their support. Um, but either way, if I am the Democratic nominee or not, uh, I look forward to working with all of you 
to get Democrats elected up and down the ticket. This is a very important election, uh, and I will do all that I can to support Haley and all Democrats that are running this year. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Um, take it away. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Um, I just want to thank the 11th uh, district for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, as I said, I have been uh, involved in Oakland County Democratic politics um, virtually all of my, uh, uh, well, all of my adult life and a little bit before that. Um, and, and I think it's terribly important for all of us, uh, wherever we place on the ticket, whether we're county commission candidate or, or county executive or treasurer, to understand what the stakes are this year. And it affects us. It affects us here this evening. Uh, it will affect us over the next few years. Uh, a, a victory by the Democratic Party as a whole uh, is not just something that would be partisan uh, satisfying for me. I've been a union member, uh, a member of a union family all my life. Uh, so that would be satisfying enough, but I think just the importance, I mean, every day you, you turn on the TV and, uh, and it's, it's, it's just incredible, the kind of things I never thought I would see. Um, and yet as Democrats, I think it's important that we stand up, uh, that we show the quality of a party that we are, the kind of beliefs that we have and, uh, and, and work on behalf of the, uh, the residents of, uh, of this county. But thank you very much for having me tonight. It was terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for both, both uh, Robert Wittenberg and Robert Corbett. Uh, we'll be running for the office of Oakland County Treasurer. We appreciate you being here and sharing your goals and vision for the office of Oakland County Treasurer. Our next segment features candidates for Oakland County Sheriff. Uh, with us tonight are Vince Gregory and Barnett Jones. Can we wave Maybe. so I can find, there you are. <laughs> we will follow the same format we've been following all evening with two minute, minute opening statement, one minute closing statement and two minutes to answer the questions. We'll start uh, with the opening statements beginning in alphabetical order and then reverse that for the closing statement. Uh, Vince Gregory, you'll be first. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Uh, good to have you here tonight. Uh, you can begin with your opening statement. You have two minutes. Okay, thank you. It's, uh, I want to thank the 11 Dems for hosting this forum. It's always nice to be able to get your message out. Uh, my, again, my name is Vince Gregory. I'm a, a Marine and a Vietnam veteran. I served 30 years with the Wayne County Sheriff's Department, 17 of those years as a union uh, vice president and then president. So during that time as the union leadership, I negotiated contracts with the late Wayne County Executive Ed McNamara, uh, County Executive Bob Fricano, then County Executive Warren Evans. After the 30 years with the Sheriff's Department, I spent 10 years as an Oakland County Commissioner, two years as a Michigan State Representative, and eight years as a Michigan State Senator. I'm running for Oakland County Sheriff because I believe there should, be, there should be much more visibility from the Sheriff's Department throughout all of Oakland County, not just a portion of Oakland County. Second thing is, we within the Sheriff's Department, we must eliminate that glass ceiling so that women can get promoted the same as men to those ranks which make a difference in the department. And then third is community policing. I believe that we need to, re, to have, the Sheriff's Department needs to be heavily involved in community policing. And by that, I mean involved with uh, the community leaders, the church leaders, the business leaders, so that we will have some sense of feeling about how the community feels about the policing that the Sheriff's Department is doing in the, in the communities in Oakland County. And with that, I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Barnett, two minutes. Hello, 11th District. My name is Barnett Jones, and I'm a candidate for the Oakland County Sheriff. I've been in law enforcement over 40 years, 19 of those years with the Oakland County Sheriff's Department, where I rose to the rank from deputy to the rank of captain. I was being trained by John F. Nichols to replace him. I didn't get the job, but I went to Sterling Heights Police Department as their chief. I was there for six years. I left there and I went to the Ann Arbor Police Department, where I was a police chief and a fire chief for almost six years. I went to uh, Flint. Uh, I helped the emergency manager, and from there I went to the Great Lakes Water DWSD Authority, where I'm now the Chief Security Integrity Officer. I am the man to do the job. I have the training, the education, the experience, and the knowledge. And on day one, I can do the job as the sheriff. 
I have a platform that includes transparency because I believe it is time for the citizens to know what's going on in the Sheriff's Department. I have a plan for inclusion because Prince is correct. There has never been a woman promoted to the rank of captain. When I left there, there were two women that I trained that were ready and willing to go. But when I'm sheriff, I will promote those women. I believe in social justice reform. We need to do something about the cash bail. I also believe in community engagement. I have a plan for putting together a citizen's advisory board that will reach out and change the way we do police work in the communities by bringing people together and giving them a voice in how we do the job. My name is Barnett Jones, and on day one, I can be the sheriff. I'm ready, I'm willing, I'm experienced, and I'm capable. Thank you, Barnett. For your first questions of the questions, both of you come from different professional backgrounds. How will you utilize your unique experience to change past practices of the Oakland County Sheriff's Office? And we'll begin with Barnett. Well, I different practical backgrounds. I've been in law enforcement for over 44, 40 years. So realistically, I worked at the Sheriff's Department and it's a matter of leadership and vision and moving through your chain of command. You get your people in, you get them trained, you give them a vision, you give them a mission statement and you bring them together as a team. You instruct them as a team. They have input so they have ownership of what your vision and mission statement is because they have participated in the process. That will give them the ability to turn around and push that back down through the organization. I have a plan for that also because that is how you change the culture of a, of a police agency. That is how you change the culture of any organization. Today, you have to give people a right to sit down and give you some input so they can provide you the input into the direction the mission statement, the vision statement, and that is what I'll do to change the culture of the Sheriff's Department and change that organization. It is a good organization. It needs real leadership. It needs a person that is a law enforcement professional to push down the changes that we see in the street, the things that are going on, the COVID-19 environment, the pandemic, all of that needs leadership ready and willing to provide the necessary tools. You take the people, you invert the pyramid, you put the people at the top, and you, me, work for them. Give them the job, give them the tools, and then as the sheriff, I'll get out of the way. Empower those people to do the job that they can do, and as the sheriff, you would turn around that culture of that department and move it to a community-based, community-oriented, community-engaged, operating sheriff's department. Thank you. Thank you good, question. good question. Vince, uh, same question. I'll repeat it. Both of you come from different professional backgrounds. How will you utilize your unique experience to change past practices of the Oakland County Sheriff's Office? Two minutes. Well, I want to thank you for that question. Uh, uh, in one way, we have a similar background in law enforcement, and I think that that really will be a benefit to any to all of the Oakland County residents uh, because we do have that. But but I also have legislative experience, experience in working with others, working across the aisle, being able to get things done. When I was in the state senate, I was a part of a committee that was able to get Medicaid expansion done. So to be able to change a culture, I think that it starts with the leadership. It starts at the top. And, and as a top, as a leader of that group, you must be able to show and lead by example. And I think that by leading it by example, and from the experience that I've had uh, within, the, within Wayne County Sheriff's Department as a leader of the uh, union, and at that time, the Sheriff's Department had the, was the largest Sheriff's Department in the county. I represented over 1,200 police officers in, in, in Wayne County. I led by example, and we did some things there to be able to move the needle, and, and Oakland County will be no different. I think these are challenging times, and I think that leadership, integrity, uh, trans, uh, all of those things that, that people are looking for right now, those are things that I've had, uh, transparency, those are things that I've been doing for years for my career, both in law enforcement and both in the legislative uh, uh, arena. I think that at this point, people want to see some changes, and that's what I will bring to the Oakland County Sheriff's Department uh, and my experience on the 10 years on the commission to be able to make some changes with the commission. I think that those are the kind of things that uh, people were looking for, are looking for and want to see with the next sheriff. Thank you, Vince. The next question, 
what experience have had you have you had in developing and managing a budget? And we'll begin with Vince. All right, that's a good question. And and, and clearly, uh, speaking of budgets, uh, as I said, I was with the Wayne County Sheriff's Department, and I, I was the lead negotiator for the Wayne County Sheriff's Department, largest sheriff's department in the state of Michigan. And yet, we sat down with the sheriff, and I did this for. Uh, for seven years as a union president, sat across the table with the county executives, we had to put together our budget, and then the county put together their budget. We would sit down and formulate, we would come together to, and try to resolve our issues, outstanding issues, to come up with a mutual agreement, something that we both could agree to. At some point, at some times during our bargaining, um, well, some during the year, some of the years, uh, the Wayne County Sheriff's Department went through some uh, trying times, um, times when they didn't have the money that they that they needed. At one point, we went three months without pay, and yet the union had to figure out a way how we would be able to sustain the officers and be able to help them. That's what leadership does, and that's how you as a union leader or a leader, period, will be able to do it. Now, as a legislature, as I indicated, uh, when I was in the uh, both the House and the Senate, I was on appropriations for 10 years, and that was about setting the budget for the state of Michigan. I was a part of that budget setting process for 10 years. So for me, budget setting is not a big issue. But let me just say, though, I am not somebody that believes that I know it all. I'm the kind of person that will bring in some budget experts to help me with that, to be able to get the best out of the department, to make sure that we don't lose anything from the department, and yet we're able to fund all of those necessary items that we need to have. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Vince. Uh, Barnett, same question. What experience have you had in developing and managing a budget? That is a good question. Very good question. In Sterling Heights, Ann Arbor, and now in my current position, I oversee and develop the budget. I, do, I go through the planning process with uh, the budget uh, staff, and we put together a budget used on last year's uh, budget analysis, uh, forecasts, and uh, we put that uh, into place. The budget is a guidepost. You can look at the budget, you can prepare the budget, but you always have to also make adjustments and do encumbrances to those budgets. In the past, I've had the experience of managing budgets that ran from 20 to $30 million to $60 million a year. And my number one object is to stay within budget because I can't stand going over the budget. That's necessary because there are budget people. With the sheriff's department, you have a budget manager and that budget manager will assist the sheriff in how the budget is put together. The current sheriff's budget is uh, 157 million point three, I think, for this current year. And it goes up about another $30,000. So it'll be about 100. 60 million uh, thereabout, and it, it includes uh, 60 million dollars to uh, road patrol and 53 million dollars to uh, corrections, and then it's split between administration and technical services and support services and the sheriff's office itself. But it's about 160 million dollar budget, and I've got the experience to manage that because no matter how big the numbers are, it's the same process and the same people sit down with you to make sure that you stay within budget. Thank you. This is a good Thank question. Um, I'd like to take a question from the chat right now. Um, and Barnett, we'll start with you on this one. Um, how do you react to the principle of defund the police? How will you redo the budgeting to assign resources proportionately to mental health services, drug services, and many other community services for which the money currently goes to law enfor enforcement. Burnett. That is a great question, especially with what's taking place today. Well, we're assuming that first of all, Oakland County is going to go to a defund status, meaning that they're gonna tell you how many millions of dollars you have to remove from the budget through the defunding mechanism because they're gonna stand up the social workers and the medical care workers to start helping and assisting with the 911 calls. So what you do there is basically when they take away the money from your budget, you begin the process of reallocating, reutilizing, reestablishing, reorganizing your department so that you can respond. There are three ways to change a police agency. You change it by reforming it, you change it by defunding it, you change it by dismantling it. 
out there today, a lot of people are saying defund, and then they're talking about dismantling. A lot of people are saying defund, and they're talking about reforming. So if it happens in Oakland County, we first must have, I will sit at the table where everybody is to figure out exactly what they are talking about doing. And then we will adjust accordingly. If they remove money from the budget, then we will reorganize the patrol section because that is where that will take place so that the officers will still be able to respond. And my idea would be that we combine the social workers with the police officers to provide them safety when they're responding to those mental health problems and those narcotic problems and those children problems. And we will be there to help them because it is a not a safe environment. Law enforcement officers get killed in domestics the social workers and the medical care workers are going to need someone there to perfect them. We already do that with special teams on the SWAT team. We have a combination of medical care workers and social workers embedded when we do a SWAT. That will be the same process. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um, Vince, same question. Uh, how do you react to the principle of defund the police? How will you redo the budgeting to assign resources proportionately to mental health services, drug services, and many other community services for which money currently goes to law enforcement? Right. Uh, another good question. That's a big issue that's going on today that a lot of people are talking about. And um, you should know that when it comes to defunding, uh, across this country, I think there's only been two cities in this entire country that's ever defunded totally defunded. There's only been one that's totally defunded. And when they defunded the department, they brought in the sheriff's department to do the patrol. And then after the sheriff's department was there for about a year, they rehired the officers. They had the officers uh, quit and they fired them. And then they ended up having them uh, where they could um, assign, they could uh, apply for the jobs again and they hired them back and then they brought in a new department. I don't think that's what's going on. What most people are talking about, I think more most people are talking about uh, some ways where they can um, uh, use some monies from the uh, sheriff's department or police departments in order to be able to do some things. For instance, if we, if you have uh, police officers that are in the schools, patrolling the schools, maybe that budget needs to be re-examined. And, and there may be several other budget areas where we need to re-examine. I think uh, the sheriff in conjunction with the county commissioners and the county executive, we would need to sit down to go over those areas where we feel that we may be able to move some monies, as, but as long as we maintain the public safe, the safety part of the department so that no resident would ever feel uh, unsecure being in Oakland County. I think that what we would have to do, as I said, we'd have to sit down with some other people to see how they felt, uh, what the county commission felt about it and what the, and what the uh, county exec felt about it because they really have hands on when it comes to the budget and they can veto or not make any recommendations for it. But, I certainly understand what a lot of people are talking about, but I do think that as the uh, as the Oakland County Sheriff, I would be willing to sit down and talk with any and all parties to see in what areas we, they're talking about that we can make these changes and to see what we could do to facilitate that and make sure that it does happen if it's possible. Thank you, Vince. The next question uh, is, how would you change the way in which the Sheriff's Office interfaces with the communities of Oakland County. And we'll start with Vince. Oh, I think that uh, at this particular point that the uh, Sheriff's Department is not as visible as it can be throughout all of Oakland County. And I think one of the areas where you can change, certainly when you talk about visibility, is even events. Uh, the Sheriff's Department can keep up with events, uh, parades, those different kind of things. And he can even make those at least to make a, to make a, a, a to be, to show up. Uh, we all pay county taxes, and those county taxes also go to the sheriff's department. And yet, if you don't ever see the sheriff, how is how is that? Uh, what does that say say to you? So, to me, I think that um, that uh, there's a lot more areas that the uh, sheriff, uh, a lot of things that the sheriff can do to be involved in the communities. I think that, as I indicated, one of them would be uh, involved with um, different events. But also, when I was with the Wayne County Sheriff's Department. I lobby along with some other deputies for secondary road fundings to be able to uh, get the deputies in all the communities. Secondary roads would be like 10 mile, 11 mile, 12 mile, the mile roads. And with those kind of fundings, the, the deputies would have a role in even local communities without taking anything away from the local communities. It would be an assist to the local community. So 
for me, I would go back to Lansing as it, it, where I know a lot of people and, and start the lobbying process for secondary roads. I know the governor uh, uh, looked at cutting some of the secondary road funding this, this uh, past year, but I certainly would go back and lobby the governor to put the money back in there for secondary roads so we would be able to expand our role as a sheriff to obviously to, to be able to uh, protect our citizens and to make sure they get all of the services from the sheriff as they possibly can. Thank you, Vince. Um, Barnett, the same question. Um, how would you change the way in which the sheriff's office interfaces with the communities of Oakland County? On day one, I'm going to put together a community review board or a community advisory board. That will be citizens made up from the county that will be a part of the a board by volunteer. I will have the unis, unions present and members of my command staff. And we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about community engagement. We're going to talk about how we patrol in the communities. We're going to give them a voice in how we patrol their community so that we are patrolling the community in a manner which makes them happy. We have no one size fits all in my vision. We have a bunch of different community engagements taking place all around the county and in the areas where we are not the primary law enforcement agency, we already back up all of the existing police departments. We're there whenever they need to have an officer there. We're there for parades and the functions. I've been there for those type of engagements in Southfield and in Oak Park working their fireworks. So all they have to do is ask and the sheriff, as sheriff, I would send my people down there as a resource for them. Because one of the things I also want to do is have a roundtable discussion with the sitting chiefs and figure out how we can expand our resources by training all of our people and preparing all of our people with the same equipment so that we can interface better and do the job as a team, not as just the sheriff's department, me, the sheriff, and you, the little guys, because that doesn't work. We have to be on the same standard, the same level to spread our resources around, to be prepared for any event anywhere in Oakland County. And that is what I would do as the sheriff, be a partner with the local communities and make sure that my people are involved in community engagement and we have a wonderful input from the communities and we design a community engagement policing program exactly what they need. That's a good question. Thank you. Okay, we have, let's see, we'll look at our time here. We're right on time, Kent. Good, huh? <laughs> um, we have actually one, one time for one um, quick question from the chat. This is from Barbara. Uh, she wants to know, if you were sheriff now, would you enforce the governor's executive orders? Why or why not? Uh, Barnett. I can answer that word. I can answer that question with one word, absolutely. I raise my right hand. I'm sworn to protect and serve the people of the state of Michigan, the people of the United States and the county of Oakland. As a law enforcement officer, it would not be the first time there would be something that maybe I didn't agree with. I've always done my job, your job comes first. So as the sheriff, the governor puts out a, a executive order, it becomes law. It's been interpreted that way for years. Therefore, what she puts down is law. We would enforce the law in Oakland County if I'm sheriff. I wouldn't send it to the health department. My deputies would be advised to do their jobs. We utilize the law, the reports, the prosecutor's office, and let the prosecutor decide if that is a good crime, a good investigation, or not. But we would follow the law. Thank, Thank you. you. Vince, your turn to answer that question. Um, and it is, uh, if you were sheriff, would you now would you enforce the governor's executive orders? Why or why not? Uh, yeah, I certainly would. And uh, regardless of who was the governor, uh, I would certainly follow the governor's order. I think that uh, what's happened so far, you know, we've had three sheriffs that uh, basically defied the governor and said that uh, her order, they didn't see it as a justifiable order. So they had some issues with it and they spoke out about it. And to me, as a law enforcement professional, that's the last thing that you would ever want to hear from a law, law enforcement professional. You know, if you're the, uh, if you're the chief, uh, uh, the sheriff in, in each county, 
people look up to you and they re and they respect you. And if you don't respect the governor and, and you speak in terms of not following an order, then that means that some of these people may feel that they can just, they're free to do what they want to do. As, as a sheriff, you cannot pick and choose the orders that you will follow. If you're get an, given an order, that's a legit, that is a legitimate order from the governor of the state of Michigan. And you are to follow that order and to do as you're supposed to do as a sheriff. You may not always agree with it, but you first that you would never ever say you disagree with it in public or put that out because as I said that that that's that's one way to um, create chaos in a uh, in a county and as we know chaos is is one of the things that's going on right now throughout the country so as a sheriff I will certainly follow the order and certainly uh, uh, have my officers uh, do the same make sure that it, it filtered through the department and they all understood that this was a valid order and it was to be followed. Thank you. So it's time for their closing statements. You each have a minute and we're going to start this time with Barnett. Speaking to the voters, the next sheriff must have the experience to maintain and just to the COVID-19 budget that is going to have impact on the Open County Sheriff's Department and across the county. The next sheriff must have the experience, the vision, the wisdom, and the knowledge to run a large organization. I have that. I have run major law enforcement agencies in this, in, in this state. The next sheriff must have the vision to put programs in place, transparency, inclusion, diversity, social engagement, uh, community engagement, and social justice rules. We must change. And the next sheriff must be able to hit the ground day one as the sheriff. We must be able, I will be able to just jump into that office because I've been trained to be there. As the next sheriff, Barnett Jones, I can do the job day one. I have the education, I have the experience, I have the knowledge. John F. Nichols gave me that before he passed on and I still have it. Thank you. Thank you, Barnett. Vince, you have a one right. I want to thank uh, the 11th district for hosting this forum. It's always great to have Democrats uh, put something together to be able to get the message out. Uh, everybody, you should know that I'm a lifelong Democrat. I've been a, a Democrat my entire life. I've served as the chair of the Southfield Dem Club and several other offices within that uh, in that organization. Also was part of the Oakland County Dems uh, for, for a while. And, and, and because of that, I've, I got to know a lot of Dems. And because of that, I've reached out and, and reached and got support from uh, Mayor Vicki Barnett of Farmington Hills, Mayor Ken Cyber of Southfield, Mayor Marion McClellan of Oak Park, uh, the current uh, county treasurer, Andy Meisner, the current state board of ed uh, person, <laughs> Tiffany Tilly. Also some unions, the UAW, AFSCME, the Carpenters, and the 14th District. I hope that the 11th District will look at those endorsements and see the Democrats and join with them in supporting me for the next Oakland County Sheriff. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. And I'd like to thank both of you, uh, Barnett Jones, Vince Gregory, candidates for the Oakland County Sheriff. Thank you very much. We're now moving on to our final segment of the Michigan 11th District Democrats Oakland County Candidates Forum. Um, we'll be meeting two, are, are we meeting both candidates? Do we have both candidates here, Kent? Do we have both candidates here? Uh, unfortunately, we do not. We just okay. have Sharon McDonald at this time. Okay. Or Karen Thank McDonald. I am so sorry, Karen. That's okay. I, I, it's I, been a I, long I, night. I <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, we're happy to have you here, Karen McDonald. <laughs> For, um, the prosecuting attorney is the chief law enforcement officer of the county charged with the duty to see that the state criminal laws are faithfully enforced and as such is a position with a great importance to our criminal justice system. Um, unfortunately, many people lose interest by the time they get down to that part of the ballot and, um, or it's just due of, to lack of information or interest. And I know as a voter myself, I'm so grateful for forums like these where I can learn more about the choices that we have um, and basically learn about county government and how it operates. So I'm. I've learned so much from this forum and from the others that have happened. So thank you for being here, Karen. Um, you probably know the drill by now, how we're doing this, but um, we will open up with your opening statement um, and you can take two minutes for that. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, my name is Karen McDonald. I am a former circuit court judge. I stepped down from the bench a year ago. Um, I did that because when you move from a nonpartisan seat to a partisan seat, um, you must step down a year ahead of the filing deadline. I served on the family court judge for a bench for six and a half years. Prior to that, I was a, an attorney in private practice for about seven years. And prior to that, I was actually an assistant prosecutor where I prosecuted mostly child sexual assault cases. So the first thing people ask me is, why would you give up such a great job as a judge, which I, I ran as a five person contested race in 2012. And the reason is um, I just got to the point that I felt as a judge, I couldn't really move the needle much by the time litigants end in your courtroom, they've already been charged with a crime. And the judge, honestly, they can sentence people, but the person like you just stated that I'm so glad we're doing these forums. The, the most important person in the criminal justice system is the prosecutor. The prosecutor decides who's going to be charged with the crime and what crime they're going to be charged with. This is extremely important and powerful. And if any of you have had anybody in your family or in your circle, your, your personal or professional circle, um, have a substance abuse issue or a mental health issue, which by the way, so many of the people in my courtroom were wrestling with those two issues, you know that the last place we want those people to end up is in jail or being incarcerated because that's not solving any of the problem. And so what really moved me to take such a bold step is that our current prosecutor does not participate in any kind of treatment court. I believe in criminal justice reform. I believe that what we are doing right now is not working and I'm not alone. Um, I, I, this is a, a national movement. It's a state movement. And, and if you watch the news and everything that's going on right now, the moment is now to have reform and real change. So that's why I did what I did and treatment courts and addressing the underlying reasons why people are going into the criminal justice system is at the core of criminal justice reform and reducing mass incarceration. Thank you. I don't have another person, so I don't know if I'm being held to the same. And I'm also wondering am I, am I, how the whole thing is gonna go. It's, oh, it's, well, you'll get the full full shot, the full uh, uh, treatment. Well, we'll stick okay. with the time the time segments, um, unless you know Kent tells me differently. I'll just stick with what, what I've told. But um, yes, we'll be going through the whole series of questions and you'll be able to answer all of them, so. Great. Um, the first question is, uh, what is the ideal prosecutor's office to you? You know, I, I started in the prosecutor's office um, earlier in my career as an assistant prosecutor. It is truly a wonderful job that is a privilege. It's a privilege to serve the county. And it's filled with a lot of people who really wanna do the right thing and advocate for victims of crime and, and seek the truth. And so what I believe is that we should have a prosecutor's office full of people that we treat like professionals. We give them discretion and empower them to use their own judgment and that we're pushing forward and with the, with the understanding that we need reform and change and we're challenging ourselves to do this in a better way. Um, that's, what it, that's what it looks like to me. But, I, but you know, the prosecutor's office can't do this alone. And one of the things that I intend to begin immediately on day one are um, advisory committees that you meet with from the community on a regular basis, not when you're just trying to get reelected. People that you, people from um, communities of color, people who um, come from the defense bar, community leaders, uh, we need to know how we're doing. And we don't know unless we, we have the, the, we're willing to sit down and talk to people and listen to people. So that is, I think, very important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question, we have seen a significant shift in the public's mindset about black lives and policing, specifically in handling policing cases. Uh, what would you see changing in the prosecutor's office on day one, if you're elected? Well, one of the most troubling things to me right now in the prosecutor's office is that in a recent forum, our current prosecutor, when we were asked almost this very 
exact question, said that she did not believe that we have racial disparity in Oakland County. And I, I, and that's troubling to me, but it's also, I think, just blatantly inaccurate. I spend a lot of my time uh, in communities like Pontiac. And in fact, I was there for this afternoon handing out um, meals to people. Um, and when I do that, I also talk to a lot of people and they're not going to tell you that there's no racial disparity. We know what the data is going to show. Unfortunately, we don't at the moment have a prosecutor who's, going, who's willing to be transparent. The, the way you start addressing racial disparity right now is by being transparent about who you're charging and what you're charging them with. That data is readily available. It's just not being released to the public. Um, I'm quite sure it will show that we charge people of color on a much higher, at a much higher rate than we do anyone else. And we know that that population is not more prone to criminality. So that is on its face unfair and not just, and it's, it's inherent racism and we have to address it. And the way to address it is to understand what we're doing. You know, with regard to what's going on in, in, in our world right now, we had a George Floyd incident in Oakland County in 2014. A, a black man, an unarmed black man was held down at the Northland Mall by three white security guards. He said for nine minutes he could not breathe and he was killed. And um, sometime after that, our current prosecutor held a, a press conference and stated she would not issue any criminal charges. So that's troubling. I mean, those three people walked away from that incident with not one criminal charge, not even an assault and battery. And that's, that's the problem. We're seeing, it's up in the news, it, it's, we're being, it's being discussed now because of what happened with George Floyd, but we, we've already had that in Oakland County. I have always felt um, that this is the prosecutor's role, that part of criminal justice reform um, is addressing this. Right now, we know that our current criminal justice system hurts two groups of people more than any other, people of color and white and poor people. Mm -hmm. So we already know that this is a problem and what we're seeing now is, is just um, really um, shining a light on that. And I have attended protests and I have spent a lot of my time um, talking to leaders and listening and, and really trying to understand how we can make this better. Thank you. Um, the next question, what policies would you like to see the prosecutor's office implement in helping vulnerable populations, such as women, LGBTQ, and seniors? One of the things that's most important to me um, is really focusing uh, in, in a specialty way, assigning prosecutors to address um, our most vulnerable populations. Um, so I will um, develop a hate crimes unit, which is assigning prosecutors to um, vertically prosecute those cases that are inspired by um, racial biases, um, how somebody identifies ethnicity, and then also an elder abuse unit where we can really um, have a prosecutor who specializes in working with um, our vulnerable elderly people who are so prone to abuse. So that, that's, that's number one. Um, number two is really creating an environment in the office where people are free to voice their opinion and um, work with victims of crime and also look for solutions so that we can try to address the underlying reasons why this, these things are occurring. Thank you. We have a question from the chat. Um, how do you comment on the perception that there is a nexus between the prosecutor's office and the police force, that this interdependence prevents prosecutors all over the country from bringing charges against police officers? I mean, I. I was an assistant prosecutor. I've been a, an attorney in private practice. I've been a judge. I understand that prosecutors and police officers work together. They're often witnesses in their cases. They testify on behalf of um, their case. They testify in courtrooms and they investigate crimes. But I believe it is my duty to be a, an independent, objective 
person when we know there's wrong wrongdoing going on in law enforcement. And I, I, I stand for that, not because, not just because it's just, it's wrong and we need to expose police officers who are, are engaging in illegal activities and, and hurting people, but also on behalf of law enforcement. They don't want those incidents to go unchecked. There are good, honest, hardworking law enforcement in this county. And if we don't have the courage and the leadership to hold the bad ones accountable, then we're really not doing anything for our community or law enforcement. So yes, it's a tough call to make, but you know what? I, I've been in, in the legal profession for over 20 years. And before that I was a public school teacher and more importantly, I've, I've raised five teenagers. So I, I understand what it's like to make the tough call. And if I'm not willing to do it, then I shouldn't be in this position. Um, so I am willing to do it. And I think with regard to the incident with Mackenzie Cochran that I just spoke of, you know, the, the, the video speaks for itself. Now the attorney general is, is reviewing it because our current prosecutor wouldn't charge. Sure, that's the hard thing to do. But what's harder is just not, not addressing it and not holding people accountable because you're turning your back on the people that are our most vulnerable. You're turning your back on communities of color. You're turning your back on people who need representation and don't get it. So sure, it's tough. And yes, it, it'll be difficult, but it's not as difficult as just ignoring somebody who died um, at the hands of a law enforcement official. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, will you support expungement uh, applications for amounts of marijuana that are now legal and support statewide le legislation that creates automatic and retroactive expungement of marijuana charges? Yes, I, I'm on the record several times saying I support expungement of those convictions. I, I don't see how having those convictions remain on somebody's criminal history um, for um, behavior that is now not criminal serves anybody. It doesn't help the person. It prevents them from probably getting housing or employment that they need. And it's not helping our community. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. And again, I go back to, I'm running on a common sense platform, um, a progressive prosecution platform that, that focuses on and being smart on crime rather than just being tough on crime. Everybody wants violent criminals off the street. I do. Um, I, I spent my time prosecuting child sexual, ch sexual assault cases and I'm a parent and a member of this county, but we have to be smarter about criminal penalty and we especially have to be smarter about incarcerating people. Thank you. Um, one more question before uh, closing statements. Uh, what sort of investment will you make? And this, this is a, a big concern is mass incarceration. What sort of an investment will you make in um, alternatives to incarceration for people with mental illness, substance abuse, et cetera? You talk, spoke to it a little earlier, but are, is there anything in particular, any programs in particular or pro, uh, steps you would take towards mass, doing away with mass incarceration? Yes, on day one, we will, I will allow my assistant prosecutors to engage and participate in our drug treatment court and our veterans court, which our current prosecutor refuses to do. And so the legislation had to be rewritten in 2008 on an emergency basis because she wouldn't participate. We're the only county in the entire state where our prosecutors can't participate in our treatment courts. But I'm not, I'm not going to stop there. I also am committed to working with the bench and many of them are my former colleagues and, I, and there's a lot of support um, to develop a mental health treatment court. So many people in the Oakland County Jail right now are there because they have a mental health issue. So many people in my courtroom were there because they had a mental health issue. We need to address this and we're not doing it. And these problem solving courts are, you know, there's great data that suggests that they work. Um, increasing criminal penalties for somebody who's got a serious mental illness is not a, not going to make them better and B, it's not a deterrent to crime because the reason they're committing the crime is because of the serious mental health issue. So that is, the, that, that is one thing I have, I know there's a lot of support for, there's a lot of resources for. We, we have the privilege of being in a county where we have 
resources for that. There's also grants for that. So I'm very excited to, to, to start that and participate in it. And it's a way of diverting people from incarceration so that they can actually get treatment. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, it's uh, time for your closing statement. Uh, you have one minute. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, it's unfortunate that uh, Jessica Cooper couldn't join us. I, I think it's always a good thing when people can see the, the, the drastic um, difference between the two of us. But I just want to say that my campaign, I, I has received every single labor endorsement there is to receive. I was just endorsed by the UAW, the um, MEA, and 20 others. Um, I, I'm happy to announce here on the Zoom call that I um, today was endorsed by our Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, which means very a lot to me because he, he really champions criminal justice reform. Um, our Attorney General, um, Femmes for Dems, has approved me as a candidate. Um, I, I can't even list all of the endorsements I have, the Open County Democratic Black Caucus. There's an army of people, in addition to that, who have come forward who don't even know me that really believe in change and reform and want this for our county. And that's why I'm running. And that's the prosecutor you're going to get on August 4th. So please join me and support. Go to my website, mcdonaldforprosecutor.com and my Facebook page and, and join the army because people want change and reform. And I'm, I'm happy to give it to them. Thank you so much, Karen McDonald, our candidate for prosecuting attorney in Oakland County. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for the opportunity. So ends another successful candidate forum. So I'd like to thank all the candidates who joined us tonight and shared their vision for Oakland County. And thank you, Kent and Louise and Renee and everyone at the 11th District Dems who put this forum together. It takes a lot of work and a lot of logistical organization. And sometimes it doesn't go as you quite plan, but uh, it somehow always comes out in the end to be a good productive evening. Um, and I applaud everyone who tuned into the forum as well. Uh, just by being here, you've become a more educated voter and you've helped strengthen our democracy. Elizabeth Warren said in one of her speeches, voting is the heartbeat of democracy. And I really think if that's the case, then getting involved in the political process is its lifeblood. So thanks for being a part of that and thanks for having me tonight. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, so I wanna take time as the chair of the district to thank Sherry Ma Mason for being our moderator this evening. She was incredible. Um, I wanna thank Louise for being our timekeeper. Louise is selling one of our shirts right now. <laughs> and um, I wanna thank you, the audience for joining us tonight. Um, I also want to humbly apologize uh, the, for Jessica Cooper not being able to make it tonight as that was an oversight on my part. I unfortunately surely forgot uh, the uh, uh, agreement we had made about three weeks ago to, um, to deal with the time for the prosecutor's portion. But um, aside from that, I'm happy that everything else went out without a hitch. Um, I hope that you folks uh, are currently getting your absentee ballots and we'll take everything you heard in, into consideration tonight. And with that, um, that being said, I hope to see you again uh, in our meeting, which we're gonna be having in about two weeks uh, at seven o'clock on Wednesday, July 15th. Thank you so much and, th and have a good night, everyone. <laughs>